Welcome to the Manx Theatre Podcast. Come on to the theatre. Hello, and welcome back to episode 56 of the Manx Theatre Podcast with me, Neil Cowan. Thank you to everyone who's listened to our previous episodes. If you're brand new to the podcast, welcome along and thanks for joining us. In this podcast, we like to try and keep you up to date with what's going on in theatre on the Isle of Man, chatting to the cast and creatives of upcoming shows to find out a little bit more about the shows and the people behind them, and also what our Manx born and bred performers are doing further afield. Coming up on this week's podcast. I'm joined by the director and leading lady of the Service Players' upcoming production of The Girl on the Train, which opens at the Gaiety Theatre this Thursday, the 27th of June. You can still listen to all of our previous episodes through all the usual podcast outlets and at manxradio.com forward slash podcasts. Whilst you're there, make sure to give us a like and click subscribe or follow or whatever it is you need to do to make sure you never miss an episode. Now... In addition to this, if you're a listener through Google Podcasts, I've been told that Google are now closing this down and everything will be moving to YouTube. Now, once we're there, you should be able to find us under podcasts on the Manx Radio channel. So make sure you subscribe to that channel to pick up the podcast. Now, if all the podcasts are now on YouTube, does that make me a YouTuber? Hmm. Anyway. Last week saw the auditions for DCU's 2025 production of Chicago, with quite possibly the biggest turnout with around 120 registering for auditions. Well, after a long week of callbacks and deliberations, the 35-strong cast list was announced on Friday evening. So, the principal cast as it stands is... Velma Kelly will be played by Jordan McCormick. Roxy Hart will be played by Evie Skillicorn. Billy Flynn will be in the safe hands of David Artis. Mama Morton will be played by Natalie Smith. Amos Hart will be played by David Britton. And Mary Sunshine will be played by Jonathan Slight. The Merry Murderesses of Cook County Jail will be June, Bryony Grant, Liz, Alice Smith, Hunyak, Ellie Quayle, Mona, Eve Pizar, and Annie, Ellie Gould. This is fantastic news for Jordan, whose last lead role was Rizzo in Greece in 2022 for Centre Stage Productions, and for Evie, who was last seen as the mistress in DCU's Evita earlier this year. Make sure you keep up to date with what's going on between episodes by following Manx Theatre Podcast on both Facebook and Instagram, and at Manx Theatre Pod on X, or Twitter as everyone still calls it. Right. Down to business. I'm joined in the studio today by the Service Players director Kim Quine and leading lady Rachel Jockin, ahead of their upcoming production of The Girl on the Train at the Gaiety in about a week's time. Kim, Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Hi. Neil. Thank you. So, Girl on the Train. Uh, So this is your your latest show production at the the Gaiety Theatre in just a a week's time. This is an island premiere, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. I think um, lots of people will know the book and lots of people have seen the film, which Mm -hmm. is very different again. The stage production, I'd say, is a nice mixture of the two. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yes, yeah. It takes all the best bits of the book and the bits of the film, but it's it's closer to the book. Oh, definitely closer to the book than the film, I'd say. Yeah, Yeah, because the the book was 2015 and the film came out pretty quickly afterwards in 2016. So I'm assuming that the play then is then has come after after that then so yeah that's right so the film for some reason they decided to set in america Mm. which can't really figure out hollywood money yeah yeah why not so yeah this is our this is not it's set in a indeterminable english town probably london-esque um which is where the book was obviously set and yeah it follows rachel Mm. yes so i'm playing rachel watson and obviously, I'm Rachel Jockin as well, so it just happens to nice just... and easy. Exactly, and um, yeah. So my character, Rachel Jock, uh, well, Rachel Watson, I should say, <laughs> um, so she plays um, uh, a character that's had a bit of ups and downs in her life, and obviously chose her way through alcoholism, and then she spots someone, a couple on the train that she just becomes so obsessed with, and makes up stories and things like that, and then the the woman of the couple disappears, and she just becomes embroiled in just wanting to know what's happened to this woman and there's just lots of twists and turns and lots of things like that isn't it so are these and these are people that she's seeing from the the, the train on her daily yeah. commute in and out yeah yeah this yeah it's a couple that she sees every day on, on, on a train to work and yeah she just makes up these stories about them she creates names she creates jobs for them she creates a livelihood for them 
and um, yeah, and then obviously there's twists and turns where it might not be so true. And of course, with her alcoholism as well, there's there's the, the fantasy part of it as oh, well. Oh yeah, and... yeah. Oh, it's a huge fantasy thing for her. She just, you know, like I say, makes up so much stories. It's just. I think with Rachel at times, throughout the story, you're not a hundred percent sure whether what you're seeing is real or whether it's what's in Rachel's head. Yeah, her, her own fantasy. <laughs> yeah, because they talk about the book being a, um, an unreliable na- narrator. So that is that that plays through with the with the the play as well, then, yeah. Oh yeah, most definitely, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd definitely say I'm unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the play. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not true. Not true. Yeah, you you see bits and pieces of flashbacks throughout the play, and you're never sure if what you're seeing is quite correct. Yeah. It changes a little bit throughout. Yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting. I think it's definitely going to be you know sitting on the edge of your seats. I'd like to think for people. Yeah. Is there is there more than one narrator to it? Is there other parts of the story told by other characters as well, or is it all all from Rachel's point of view? No, in the play it is more just from Rachel's point of view. It's it's her going through this journey, trying to figure out what happened to this beautiful, perfect woman that she sees and envisages. Yeah. And then it all unravelling as she goes along and gradually remembers what really happened. Mm. I mean, obviously, when you're talking there about about the flashback scenes, obviously much easier to to to, to cover with a with a cutaway and an edit in a, in a film kind of stage. How are you sort of going about doing that with on on stage? Well, thankfully, Kim has been amazing because I even thought of how to do a scene like that. You know, you yeah. go on stage, you act, but how are you then to make sure that the audience know that this bit is going to be like a, a memory scene or a dream scene or whatever but Kim has just been fantastic as a director and been able to envision it and, and it, it, it has worked very very well well I think it has I'll take that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um it's been a challenge definitely it's not an easy one to stage but all I'll say is we've got a lot of great sound effects and a lot of very very clever lighting we've brought in Josh from Gear Industries to help with that so you know together with the gaiety staff we're going to create something that it doesn't really work without all of that tech oh, in it yeah. does it mm-hmm. and, until we get in the theater next week yeah then it will really come together we kind of know how it should work yes and then we've got to kind of design that and make it happen when we get in there so it's not going to be a quick tech then no i mm. I, I expect it might be a couple of days <laughs> yeah. it's all right when you're in you know when you're rehearsing and you've got someone saying right the train's going past now or there's a flash of light here or it's flashlight there but it's definitely going to change when you know when you go on stage. Yeah, it's it's one thing in St Peter's Church Hall to, to do that, <laughs> but then to get onto the gaiety stage with all the lights and oh, stuff. Yes. It's, yeah. it's going to take a little bit of get, getting your head around, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're also obviously we're we're staging it and we uh, we know what we're doing, but actually when we get into that theatre, we might have to move people around depending mm-hmm. on where the lighting mm-hmm. works. Though there might be a lot of tweaking to do in the couple of days before. Just depending on what is physically possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Brilliant. So let's let's have a look at the at the cast then. So who've who've we got in the cast? And obviously we've, so we've got Rachel Jockin here as as Rachel Watson. Mm-hmm. Got the wonderful Jeff Pugh as mm-hmm. Di Gaskell. He didn't pay yes. me to say that, obviously. <laughs> Very pleased yeah. to get Jeff. We got him to agree before he won his best actor. At the one at festival, and I was very pleased that I got in there. <laughs> got in before his fee went up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we have Toby Smith playing Tom Watson. I'm assuming that's Rachel's husband. Ex, yes. Oh, ex-husband, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, always, always fun when Toby's around. But <laughs> oh, once we get past the jokes, he he really does get down to business, and he does it very, very well. And I think in this one, you see a different side to Toby. Mm. Oh yes, definitely. This oh. is a very darker side to Toby, which I think he's enjoying quite a lot, actually. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not going to ask whether he's off book yet, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't answer that. Uh, then we've got uh, oh, someone who's it was new to me, Ben Davenport as Scott Hipwell. Yeah, so I think this is Ben's first time back on the stage in about 20 years. Oh, wow. First time on the Gaiety stage as well. Gaiety yeah. stage, yeah. Um, and, yeah, he's new to the society. It's the first time we've worked with him. And I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure. He's really brought the character of Scott Hipwell, who is the husband of Megan, who goes missing, to life. And um, the different sides of that character, he's just really worked hard and got those down really nicely yeah, hasn't he so. oh absolutely and then so Megan Hipwell then that goes missing that's played by Kelly Firth oh. yes Kelly's been with us for a few years now at service players always a pleasure to work with Kelly I will say bring your tissues oh. because that girl is going to play on your emotions 
Right. Mm. Okay. Oh, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Do you know, I've I, I've seen she had put a, a, a post up on Facebook yesterday because some of your advertising going out and you've got like that that Megan Hipwell is is missing and <laughs> she's going. I'm just letting you know. I am safe. I am well. This is just an, a poster for well, a production been, I'm doing. She's been approached twice now, hasn't yeah. she? Yeah, at the yeah. gym. <laughs> yeah, at the gym, asking him about her missing poster. Just goes to show that the the, uh, the advertising's working. Then oh, absolutely. it's getting out there and people mm-hmm. are seeing it. Yeah, which is brilliant. Then we have Alice Spencer as Anna Watson. Yes, so Alice has been in other productions, but not with service players. It's her first time with us. She has brought bags of energy and enthusiasm. And it's been really interesting to see her really hone that character of Alice Mm -hmm. and take on the, we'll say, under the thumb, abusive relationship. Right. But also show the strong side of her, the, the fight that is still there as well. So it's been really interesting to watch her develop that. Yeah, I, I did uh, spam a lot with with Alice about five years ago, and yeah, she's mad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then the final part, Kamal Abdich. I'm going to let you pronounce his name because I'm I can't. <laughs> yeah, Ilya is the first time on the Gaiety stage. Mm-hmm. And he's been doing acting lessons and things as well. And you can really see that he's very, very concentrated on getting the exact emotions. His his performance is very exact. Oh, and yes. He's really interesting to watch. We've we've brought it out a little bit more for, for stage, which, again, he's been a pleasure to work with in that sense, seeing him oh, develop yeah. that mm-hmm. character. Because, again, all the characters are really interesting. You... you meet them they're introduced to you and you think that you know them and then as Mm -hmm. it goes on every single one of them has twists and turns and changes and you realize you didn't know them at all excellent oh that's that sounds really exciting and interesting so rachel you've been with the service players for for quite a few years now Ah, i think it's been i think i joined about 2013 so nearly 11 years now so how how did you get started in the first place what was it that that drew you into into acting theater world well I, i was doing um uh, theatre and sorry TV and film sort of like things you know classes and stuff like yeah. that and that stopped and I thought you know what I, I really enjoyed acting I love like getting out and to be someone else's character and then I was lucky enough to come across the service players who are always always wanting people new people to come and you know and join so I was, I was so embraced by them so yeah I just started with them and then but my first ever time on stage actually wasn't with the service players it was uh-huh. with the legion players oh yeah so um that was quite fun in spectacles um and then oh, yeah. The year later, I did the one acts with the service players, and then I did the lower low, which was my very first play, and it was one of my favourites. I have to say, I absolutely loved the lower low. Just such a good cast, and it just made me realise that I just absolutely love theatre, and I love the gaiety. There's nothing better than standing on that stage, looking out, and just knowing that you're in such a beautiful place. Were you, were you Michelle? I the, was the the yes. um, the I French sh- Resistance fatal. I shall seize his <laughs> Yeah, Do you know, I, I went to see that, and I'm sat there in the audience, and I've watched a lower low since I was a kid, mm. and it was on that night with H doing the the inspector, <laughs> and it it was just the the loudest penny drop I think I've I've ever experienced as I real suddenly realised that the reason why he is speaking so bad English, even though he's English, is yeah. because. Everyone is speaking French. Yeah. <laughs> and, and although we're having it as English, that's, yeah, and he's just, yeah. Just, oh, he was yeah. fantastic doing that. It was a proper head, forehead slap moment. I'm like, why has it taken me 30 years to work this out? Yeah. You just appreciate as well that what, what you know, especially what Howard brought to that character, oh, yeah. like having to learn all those lines in such a way. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to be able to do that. So was was Michelle then, was that your, your first sort of proper role or you had... Well, like I say, the first time I was on stage when I did Inspector Calls, I was actually meant to be the maid. Right. And But the girl who was playing Sheila Burling dropped out. Oh, right. And then they're like, oh, what are you doing? And I was like, okay, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And then I looked at the script and I was like, ah, okay, mm. so I've got to learn all this now. So that was my first major one was, was Sheila Burling. And then and then it was Lolo with Michelle. Speaking of learning all of this, I was mm-hmm. having a conversation with Mr. Pugh the other day, and we were talking about amounts of, of lines to learn. And last mm-hmm. year with One Man to Governors, I had an oh, awful yes. lot to yeah. learn. But I believe you have even more because you're in every scene and everything is conversational and every other line is basically yours. Yeah, I would, I'd say I'm probably on stage 98% of the time. I think I go off stage once. For like right. the yeah. whole of two minutes, and that's it. So long enough to go to the loo, and that's it. Uh, not even that. <laughs> not even no. that. <laughs> and there's a lot of drinking through this, so yes, I'm sure there will be at one point. <laughs> yeah, Rachel has been, I have to say, absolutely incredible. Right from the start, from the first rehearsal, she knew the first six pages already 
it was it's been incredible to watch and yeah there have been little bumps along the road but that's what we expected <laughs> mm-hmm. you know but when casting you know when you just see someone do a part yeah. and you think that is that's Rachel that's that's who that person should be yeah um and it, it was definitely that moment we had a lot of conversations beforehand mm-hmm. just just to make sure that we were okay with quite how much it was yeah I did educating Rita last year so mm. I was very much aware of quite how much it takes and especially with young family and yeah. other commitments as well um but no Rachel is incredible and I mean, come to see her if nothing else, and just oh. see what she's achieved. She's Maybe blushing in the corner. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm That's what corner. we were trying to do. Do you know? I often, I often find that that big chunks of dialogue that like that are much easier to learn than small bits because I think oh, you yeah. look at that and you go, "I have all this to learn." So you make the effort of learning it and getting rid of it and mm-hmm. getting off book sooner. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a small amount, you kind of go, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll know those. I'll know those in time. I'll, I'll be, I'll be fine." Well, you know yourself, like you say, the big chunks. You know, you, you, you can make that. Well, not make that, but you know that better than say yeah. just that one liners. And then sometimes they'll say a line, but you've got to go completely off base and go to a different sort of like um, story or something, and that confuses me a lot. I have to say, I think the line that you struggled with the most is, "I'm sorry." Yeah. <laughs> All oh, of the I'm big chunks. Just not used to apologising now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of that. Or yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's those little bits that yeah. you, because you think, ah, oh, that's easy, but it's those bits that do catch you out every now and then, isn't mm-hmm. it? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it's, it's when it's like a, a dozen or so lines, and then you've got one line in the middle of it, and then there's another dozen or so lines before your next line, and it's like, I know I've got a line around here somewhere. When it comes, it's yeah, it's, it's, you're waiting. Okay, it's, it's gone silent. Quiet. It's time for my line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know yourself, you can appreciate that. You know that with like the, all those lines was with you for last year. Yeah, yeah. You're more determined than ever to learn your lines, I think, because you know you've got such a huge part and you don't want to let anyone down, you don't want to let yourself down, and you want to bring out the best in that character. You're determined, you know, so don't get me wrong, I'm never usually like that, and I'm sure you can ask a lot of people that I'm never off book. Did, did, did you find yourself at some point going, come on, I've learned three times as much dialogue and you've only got two lines in this scene, why haven't you got off book yet? No, because I'm just too paranoid thinking about my own lines, I'm thinking, <laughs> because I'm so worried that I don't want to give them the wrong prompt, that I'm like, no, I can't. I don't feel like I can say anything to them just yet, wait until after the play and then I'll just say, you're rubbish. Right. <laughs> I think um, all three of us having d- now done these big roles that need a lot and I think you know yourself when you go for that it's it's kind of your own personal challenge yeah. isn't it? and and kind of proving to yourself that you can do it and oh, yeah. I had that very much with Rita and I think that's been the same for you with Rachel oh absolutely yeah oh no 100% that has been I mean it's it's been hard work I'm not gonna lie mm-hmm. but it, I've enjoyed it and yeah. I'm, I am very much looking forward to next week to bringing it to life to showing everyone and I just hope everyone appreciates all the work we've done and put through to it. So I'm sure they will. Um, okay, so looking back on some of the production that you've done, mm-hmm. you've probably worked in a few productions with different levels of budget. Yeah. <laughs> so they're for costume, okay? And not different periods as well, different time periods as mm-hmm. well, different types of costume. What would you say is the best or the worst costume that you've had? I, I can't think of like a specific thing, but I love period dramas. Roles. Yeah. I love, you know, flouncing around in a dress and getting my hair all done and things like that. So for me, it's got to be a period drama. Any big flouncy dresses, anything like that. I'd say. Yeah. Worst might have been actually, I wouldn't say it's my worst, but probably the funniest is probably my um, Black Adder where I had to be, uh, what was it, the Spanish, like the Spanish guard. And I had to like jump around, had like a, a leather cap on my head, and had to flounce around, you know, on like, fuego. Like the torturer was the torturer. That's yes. it. Yes, the Spanish torturer. That was hilarious. But yes, I had to jump around the stage, looking a bit like a wally on that one. Yeah, Jack Divers had a similar kind of little sort of leather cap. Yeah. when he played Patsy in in Spamalot, he, he was sweating so mm-hmm. much underneath it because it just didn't breathe. It yeah. just trapped and just yeah, it wasn't a nice place to be. I've got a new question, a couple a new question here for this Go one. For it. uh, it's just something that came came to me the other day. You're allowed to keep one costume and or prop from any show that you've been in. What is it and why? Oh, I don't know. You know, I was, I was thinking about this. I mean, there's always going to be you know props that you want to keep, but it's more, probably more stupid things of like you know like yeah. I remember doing Flare Path and the late Ian. Unfortunately, I can't remember his surname. Torbett. Torbett. Yes, he was like our props table and he made these like little cardboard eggs yeah i remember me and rach webb we used to like take them all the time and get very annoyed with us but if, if there's anything for the silliest of things yeah. it probably if i could have kept that just for the memories i probably would have kept that so i know it sounds stupid but it's the only thing that really pops into my head that i would have kept yeah the most recent thing that i've acquired <laughs> no, <God. laughs> was uh, I, I did sweeney todd two years ago 
and had this truncheon and I, the truncheon had been yeah. all the way through rehearsals and it may have fell into my bag on the way out of the theatre. <gasps> <laughs> You're saying that now. Do you know, it, it was an old broom handle with a bit of tape and a bit of, bit oh, of rope okay. around the top, but you know, it was, it was I'd grown quite... I'd, memories. Yeah, I'd grown quite accustomed to it over the, the period of the, <laughs> the four or five months of rehearsals. So it was like, you know, I'm just taking that home as a, as a little yeah, sort of... I'm yeah. sure they love that at home. Yeah, it keeps the kids in line. You yeah, know. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Now this this is probably a very very applicable one for for, for service players because things go wrong from time to time. Mm-hmm. What's the strangest or funniest thing that's happened to you on stage, and have you managed to keep it from the audience? Well, unfortunately, like my my biggest embarrassing thing. Well, actually, you might tell me different, but it wasn't with the service players. It was with another play. Uh-huh. I was playing um, Corella Deville, and I had this very tight black dress on, and it was zipped, like obviously it was zip up the back. Yeah. But I had to do like this monologue to the thing and like being like the evil. And just slowly, I could feel a zip going down, <laughs> and it was a low cut thing. All right. So I'm trying to like maneuver and do my thing, and then, but I could just feel it very slowly going down, zip, <laughs> and just feel this the, my shoulders coming up. And looking at it, like, I was coming to the end of my monologue, and I just sort of shy, like side shuffled off. Because <laughs> by the time I came on stage, it was like, Poof. so that was like probably my time on stage. I'm like, oh my god. I'm gonna, like flash everyone here. <laughs> just about managed to get away with it though. Yeah, just about. Um, but with service players. It's probably me fluffing my lines. Probably, my, that's probably me, my most embarrassing thing. Of any all of time. my stories from service plays probably involved Toby. Well, I didn't want to say, but yeah, let's not lie. That's fair. Yeah, it's quite fair to say. Kim, what about you? I was just trying to think. In the right in the middle of a very romantic song in Dick Barton, one of my full snails pinged off, and I was just looking, thinking, if I just blinded someone in the front row but no it was fine I I retrieved it after the curtain call but I think service players didn't happen to me but it's the story that always comes up is doing yes minister and well we had we flew in the door of number 10 and this one time Toby wasn't quite clear so he um he ended up with a bit of a head injury but we always now joke about Toby getting hit in the head so anytime we think about flying anything we think about whether we can damage Toby with it so is that the reason why Toby's Toby then because he got hit in the head no i i just i think it might make him better that. if anything that, right, okay. lack of spatial awareness trying to give him some you know excuses there, but you know <laughs> it didn't work no no <laughs> You're listening to the Manx Theatre Podcast with Neil Cullen. Right, Kim, so this is this is your first time directing, isn't it? It is. I thought I'd choose an easy one to get started with. Yeah. So how, how are you finding this as a, as a challenge then, as a, as a director? Well, I was asked if I'd direct. I said, mm, only if I can find a play that I really want to do. I, I wasn't sure. I've got other ideas in mind, but they weren't right for yeah. now. Um, so it's something I've always wanted to do, but I read through so many scripts and so many uh, blurbs and I just couldn't find anything yeah and then I was about to give up on about page 67 of the Concord website (laughs) and came across Girl on the Train which obviously I'd heard I didn't know all that well yeah to be honest beforehand um but it was just as soon as I started reading it I messaged Toby and was like can I buy the script I think I need to read this one so um read it through straight away and it just came to life in my head I mm. was just like, I know how I could do that yes I could see it and that's what I needed I needed to read something and be able to know or have a an initial idea yeah, yeah. yeah and I could just see it and I was like right well it's that or nothing yeah and that was it that was it and away you went so it's I guess it's a it's a pretty pretty meaty thing to get your teeth into then lots of you like you said before that you know there's lots of technicalities into it and lots of lots of planning on that yeah trying to figure out how to get people from the current day scene into a flashback scene yeah how to make it clear it's a flashback it's quite a modern setting so there's no big sets it's it's suggestions yeah. of set so making sure that then it doesn't look like a half empty stage at yes. times so lots of very clever lighting and I said from the start that's going to be a real key so we got in touch with a couple of people and we were put in the direction of gear industries so we went had a meeting with Josh and I was like right so I've got this idea in my head which you're now going to kind of have to see if you can decipher started telling him and he just got it as well yeah it just all started coming together he had some brilliant ideas because although it's girl on the train you're not really going to see her on the train yes because budget doesn't go to a train (laughs) in the gaiety stingy Um, Toby I know right but I think you'll be surprised and impressed with what's what's going to come and you will have that effect of train yeah. without 
physical train. I mean, there's the things you can do with lighting that's a, yeah. a suggestion of a train with a, a flash of lighting to, to think of the windows and trees and things going past. And Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you, you'll, uh, yeah, you'll see. I'm go- not giving anything more away on that. Fabulous. Okay, I'm looking, for, looking forward to seeing this. So obviously then with, with all of the sort of technicalities and things, I'm guessing you've, you've probably got quite a, a big backstage crew to sort of help you with all the mechanics of things. Yeah, so not big as such, but very experienced and people that we know and trust was yeah. really important. This isn't a show where you want to take any chances whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, um, there's Someone a lot. For the first time. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot that could go wrong and really spoil that effect. So we've got Mike and Neve Cowan, who are our stage manager and deputy stage manager. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they are. They've been with us for a number of shows now, yeah, yeah. and are just fantastic. What Mike doesn't know about the theatre isn't worth knowing. To be <laughs> no, honest. no, no. Um, so they have been fantastic, and I was very specific at the start that the you know one of the things that is one of my bugbears is scene changes, mm-hmm. and if if they're really clunky and and take too long, and there isn't time for them to take long in yeah. this. It's it's very much uh, sweeping from one side of the stage to the other and getting stuff on and off because it'll destroy the pace and, exactly. Yeah. So they've been brilliant working with that and and sitting through and say how many pieces of furniture, how many people do we need for each of those? When do we need the fly? When do we need this? Yeah. So yeah, they've been fantastic. I've had my production team of Lisa and Toby Smith who have been amazing as always in the background. Just couldn't do it without them, especially Lisa. She's just absolutely wonderful at this stuff. And I think all of us at Zoe's Plays would be lost without her. And I've had Viv, who is my assistant director. Yes. And yes, that that woman can organise stuff. And right. that's exactly what I needed with this. It's There's so much creativity needs to go into making it work. I didn't need to be thinking about making props lists and costume lists and things like that. And she has just taken all that and done it wonderfully and it's just all happens and, and things appear and these props appear and you think oh this is great brilliant well, it takes the pressure off you then so you can yeah. just concentrate on what's going on in front of you rather than having to do all those jobs as well exactly and yeah she as well she just understood what the vision was from the start so yeah. it's been brilliant to be able to bat those ideas back and forth as well and i have to say the entire team um both the cast and the crew have been brilliant as well for suggesting creative ways to get round issues and yeah. um, ways that we could look at the staging and ways to make it all work because although I had the basic idea I'm like right let's try it first and then when it doesn't work yeah. we'll figure out why it doesn't work and every single person has been brilliant in coming forward with some really interesting solutions to problems or interesting ideas of how to make it even better yeah and um, so some we've used some some haven't but no it's Mainly nice Toby's that you didn't pretty much yeah. yeah just just nod and smile at him yes. and then say no <laughs> but no it's it's been really nice because i really feel like my vision from the start is coming to life yeah but even better from every it feels like a real team effort on this one fantastic and as well as all that is if she's not doing enough lisa is also in corner calling the whole show we have spent two hours the last week going through all of the cues there's something like 87 lighting cues wow. about 80 sound cues things flying in and out all over the place so all sorts of things going on so yes she's got i think she, i don't know if she's regretting taking it on but she's doing an absolutely fabulous job of that as well wonderful i mean i would imagine with with all that technology this is probably the the most flying lighting and sound cues in in any service players show ever yeah i mean the first page, there's about 10 different cues, <laughs> and it's not even started. There's no dialogue yet. It sounds like a musical. <laughs> it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Fantastic. Okay, way, way back in 2020, after the first big lockdown, mm-hmm. we created our musical theatre playlist. The idea of this was to create the ultimate playlist mm-hmm. of, of, of theatre show tunes. Neil King and I, who was my co-host at the time, yeah. we each put 10 songs in, so we had a decent base to start with because no one wants to listen to a, a playlist with only two songs. Yeah, yeah. It's a very short playlist. Mm-hmm. And then every guest that's, that's come onto the podcast since then has added their own song. Now, we are getting quite a big list here now. Oh. I mean, we're up to 97 Ooh. now. Kim did previously have one on. She was in a couple of years ago for Dick Barton, and Kim chose Think of Me from The Phantom of the Opera. And now these songs are songs from shows that we've either performed, shows that we've been in, or they're just a, a favourite show, a favourite song, or maybe something that means something special to mm-hmm. you. 
that's why in mine I chose Seasons of Love from Rent because we had a group of friends that sang at our wedding. Oh, oh that's nice. So that's that's one I put in because it's it's something special, something really nice. So Rachel, what song would you like to add, and and why? Unfortunately, I've never been in a musical. As much as I would love to be able to get on stage and belt a tune, I think I'd probably empty the theatre. But one song that comes to mind for me has got to be the Greatest Showman, and this is me. Just I think just the lyrics in that are just fantastic, and it always brings me joy and it makes me sing along when I'm in the car, whether people want to hear it or not. <laughs> uh, Kim, what about you? What song do you want to add? Uh, I struggled with this last time as well. I, I find this very stressful. Mm-hmm. I think, though, this time I will go with, from Annie, one of my favourite things when I was younger, when I was doing theatre, I was Grace Farrell. And so I got to sing I Think I'm Gonna Like It Here Yeah. with Annie, and I, I think it'll have to be that one because I always think fondly of it. I can still remember most of the words. That's a lovely story. Not like mine. Thanks. God. Lovely. So, The Girl on the Train is playing at the Gaiety Theatre from Thursday the 27th to Saturday the 29th of June with nightly performances at 7.30. If you've not done so already, make sure to get your tickets from villagaiety.com or by calling 600 555. Kim, Rachel, thanks for joining me on the Max Theatre Podcast and I wish you and everyone involved at the service players all the very best for The Girl on the Train. Thank you very Thank much, you, Neil. Thank Speak you. to you again soon. Bye. Bye. You're listening to the Manx Theatre Podcast. After a 20-year hiatus, Dramatis Personae are back with a production of Noel Coward's Private Lives at the Erin Arts Centre from the 11th to the 13th of July to celebrate Noel Coward's 125th anniversary. Private Lives tells the story of a divorced couple who, while honeymooning with their new spouses, discover that they are staying in adjacent rooms at the same hotel. Despite a perpetually stormy relationship, they realise they still have feelings for each other. The cast includes Howard Kane, Sharon Walker, John Walker and Rachel Jockin again. She's a busy girl. Performances are at 7.30 each evening with additional matinee performance on Saturday the 13th of July. You can book tickets by visiting the Erin Arts Centre website which is erinartcentre.com. On Sunday the 14th of July at 2pm the DCU Choir are having their summer concert at the Erin Arts Centre once again. No doubt this will be full of wonderful show tunes. And again, you can book tickets by visiting the Aeronaut Centre website. At the same time as both of these, Two Feathers are back at the Gaiety with Jersey Boys, the story of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, from the 12th to the 20th of July. There are performances at 7.30 each night, except on Sunday the 14th, which has a 2.30pm matinee only. And on Saturday the 20th, there will be both a 2.30 matinee and a 7.30 evening performance. In the next episode, I'll be chatting about the show with Two Feathers producer Alex Toohey and one half of their directing dream team, Mark Hilton. Taylorian Productions will be bringing the music of Queen to the Gaiety stage with their production of We Will Rock You from Thursday the 1st to Saturday the 10th of August. Performances at 7.30 each night with the exception of Sunday the 4th which has a 5pm matinee only. Both Saturdays will also have both a 2.30 matinee and a 7.30 evening performance. So... With that, we bring episode 56 to a close. Thanks once again to Kim and Rachel for joining me on the podcast, and we wish them and everyone involved at the service players all the very best with the girl on the train. Don't forget to check out the Spotify playlist by searching for Manx Theatre Podcast, and that's all one word. There is almost 100 tracks on there now, and nearly seven hours of show tunes to satisfy your musical theatre needs. If you have any events that you'd like us to talk about or promote on a future episode, you can contact me through the social media accounts or by email to manxtheatrepodcast at gmail.com. All that remains is to say thanks for listening, and I hope you join me again next time. I've been Neil Callan, and you've been listening to the Manx Theatre Podcast. Goodbye. The Manx Theatre Podcast, taking a look behind the scenes of Manx Theatre. And an actor's life. For me